Lightfoot and Bob Dylan have a very strong connection. Your, your listeners may not realize this, but you know Bob Dylan um, is one of uh, Lightfoot's biggest fans. I'm wondering if you can explain where Gordon fits in Canadian history. And let me ask you this, because there was something in the book that was interesting. Gordon did a concert in Ontario in 2004. Uh, Dan Aykroyd and Tom Green introduced him. And one of the things they said was, he's part of our national spirit. What, what does Gordon mean to Canada? Well, you know, I, I say in the book, Robert, that you know there, there probably isn't... Um a Canadian figure who so perfectly captures, you know, the what it is to be Canadian and, and just the, the spirit of, you know, living in Canada, the, the, you know, the connection to the land and so on, as, as Gordon Lightfoot does. I mean, you know, we have, we have our painters, you know, the Group of Seven or Emily Carr. You know, we have um, historical writers like Pierre Burton who documented so much of Canada's history and so on, but... It was Pierre Burton himself who wrote a book about the building of the Canadian Railway called The Last Spike, who, who, who once told Gordon Lightfoot, you did more good with that one song, Canadian Railroad Trilogy, than I did with an entire book. So, I mean, that to me is one of the, the ways to sort of sum up just how embedded Lightfoot and his music has, has become with Canadian history, Canadian culture. He, he's just absolutely revered here. Is there a comparable artist here in the States? I mean, is he like a Paul Simon? Is he like a Neil Diamond? Or, or is it something that transcends that? He's a little bit of, no, I think he's a little bit of, of Paul Simon. I mean, you think of some of the, the Paul Simon songs, like, you know, I mean, like, Amer you know, songs like America, you know, America, um, you know, he, he's he's written a lot too about about um, traveling in in America and and just feeling tied to the the culture, the people, the land. But you know, I think Lightfoot maybe because um, he consciously um, drew from his upbringing in a small Ontario town, um, Aurelia, and really embraced um, nature. And, you know, and then later, Robert, he went on these marathon, and this is in the 70s and 80s, he went on marathon canoe rides all across the Canadian North in the Arctic, and he drew from those, those uh, scenes and those, uh, you know, he, he's very painterly in that respect. I mean, if you look at a song like Whispers of the North, or, you know, um, you know songs where, like, an early song like Pussy Willow's Cattails, I mean, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's, he's really managed to capture uh, like no other uh, Canadian, Canadian, the Canadian landscape as well. You know, he did later in his career what was a Yellow Canary Canoe. Was that the title of that song? A Yellow Canoe. It's exactly right. That, that was actually one of the canoes he he would take on these these. Uh, when I say marathon canoe trips, these are like seven hundred, six seven hundred mile long uh, trips that would take like three weeks. And uh, you know, so he's he's always been. You know, since he was a, a boy growing up in this small town, Aurelia, you know, he's always felt very connected to uh, the water because Aurelia is on two lakes, um, Lake Simcoe and Lake Kuchiching. And uh, so as a boy, he was fishing. He was, you know, he was always around the water and, and around the woods in and around his hometown. And uh, that really colored his, his outlook. You know what? He did something interesting when his fame started to grow and he was based in Toronto. He, he had an opportunity, and, I, and from what you said in the book, the people were telling him, go to L.A. or go to the States. He stayed in Toronto uh, to continue his work. How, how unusual is that for somebody of his status? Well, she, that was highly unusual because um, all of his contemporaries, really, um, when you think of um, Joni Mitchell, uh, Neil Young, uh, members of the you know the band uh, Robbie Robertson and 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 the others um, a, a group like Steppenwolf that came out of Toronto I mean they all moved to the states because at the time Gordon Lightfoot started out um, and they started out there really wasn't much of a Canadian record industry and it was felt that you really had to go to New York or L A to make it and uh, and 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 Gordon Lightfoot um, has, it sort of speaks to his Canadianness. 
that he he couldn't bring himself to move, despite the fact that it would have probably furthered his career at the time. And he built his career from Toronto with the help of an American manager initially, I might add, Albert Grossman, who was also Bob Dylan's manager. And Bob De- um, Albert Grossman uh, managed a Canadian folk duo by the name of Ian and Sylvia. And they were friends with, with Gordon Lightfoot and had heard his very earliest songs. And it was they that recommended Albert Grossman check out this new young songwriter from Toronto. You know, in a way, he seemed like out of place. He wasn't a showbiz type of guy, and yet, in reading about him, he did some very practical things because he understood they needed to be done. For for example, uh, the, the album that eventually became known, If You Could Read My Mind, had a different title at the beginning. Yeah, it started out as Sit Down Young Stranger, which was um, one of the songs on the album, and you know, when Warner Brothers uh, called him and told him that they, you know, that they were getting traction on the song "If You Could Read My Mind," um, I think it was a Seattle DJ started playing it, and it, it kind of spread like wildfire. The song started getting picked up on radio stations all across the United States, and Warner in L.A. called called Gordon Lightfoot and said, "We really think we should be changing the name of the album to "If You Could Read My Mind," and he said. No way. And, you know, it, he had to fly down to, to, to have a word with him because he really was dead set against it. And they convi- they, I tell the story of how uh, Warner Brothers explained it to him in very mathematical terms. They said, you know, the difference between it, 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 changing it, to, if you could read my mind, is the difference, you know, uh, like seven to one. I mean, basically, in, ter- in sales terms, it, it would be seven times as, as, as lucrative to have it named after the, what, what had become a hit single. And, and you're right, Gordon Lightfoot was, is a practical man, and he saw the value in that, and he thought, okay, well, I guess I'm just going to have to let, you know, let it get renamed. And, uh, boy, that album really, that, that was the start for him. Yeah, that was his first big hit. Uh, and I, th- I think you said in the book the sales went from 60000 to, to 650000 with within six weeks of changing the name. Right. It, it, was, it really snowballed. And, uh, I mean, it... Uh, you know, he, he's, had, he's had other successes, but that, that was the song that really started, started for him. You know, as, as, a, as a recording star, I mean, as a songwriter, of course, it goes back earlier, Robert, as you know, to, um, you know, I think uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary singing, uh, recording his, uh, you know, For Love and Me and uh, Early Morning Rain. Uh, those two songs of, of Lightfoot's really got the ball rolling as a, for him as a songwriter. Then Marty Robbins covered uh, his Ribbon of Darkness, that became a number one country hit in the U.S. And, uh, you know, I think it won him a songwriting award as well uh, from from ASCAP. So, you know, there were early successes, but uh, but that was in, in terms of his him as a songwriter. As a recording star, yes, it was the album if you and the song, If You Could Read My Mind. Did he want to just be a songwriter, or it sounds like in the book he just loved performing from an early age, but was that really a dream of his, to be a successful performer? Well, I, you know, it's funny, um, Robert, he, he did a um, an onstage kind of Q&A. Um, well, it wasn't really a Q&A, it was, it was two songwriters talking about their craft, and it was Gordon Lightfoot and actually another famous Canadian Gordon, um, at least famous in Canada, Gordon Downey, Gord Downey of the, tra- the band The Tragically Hip. And mm-hmm. the two of them were on stage, and they were each asked the question, you know, how, you know, how do you see yourself as, a, as, a, as an artist, a singer, a songwriter? And Lightfoot answered, I see myself as a performer. You know, an, ent- mm-hmm. uh, no, an entertainer, he said. I see myself as an entertainer. And I thought that was really interesting, because, you know, you've heard... Bob Dylan and Lightfoot and Bob Dylan have a very strong connection. Your your listeners may not realize this, but you know Bob Dylan um, is one of uh, Lightfoot's biggest fans like, in terms of his songwriting, and has often spoken highly of of of, uh, of Lightfoot's songs. But you know he he has recorded himself "Early Morning Rain." Dylan has, and uh, he's performed several of of Lightfoot's other songs in concert over the years. But uh, you know, Dylan and, and, and Lightfoot, um, you know, Dylan also, you know, has that kind of uh, almost uh, offhand way of looking at himself. He calls himself a song and dance man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and so for, to hear Lightfoot say, no, I'm just an entertainer, you know, I, 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 I thought that was really remarkable because, you know, he is so revered for his song, his songs. And, uh, and I, I think in answer to your question, he has always um, 
loved performing. I think um, songwriting, which he does so well, is effort. You know, I mean, he has to really apply himself, and uh, he, he labors over over the songs and and works them like a almost like a um, you know a woodworker would. You know, uh, just crafting and recrafting. Um, sanding and, and uh, you know, re-whittling or whatever, you know, just, just, just reworking the songs until they come down to the final product that he's most happy with. But performing, you know, it, 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 it's like he lives for that. Uh, he, he, he's been doing it since he was a small boy because he started out as a choir boy and then he won awards as a boy soprano and his, his mother was always encouraging him, but he got into barbershop quartets and then and then soon into folk music, but he's always loved the uh, being on stage and 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 giving the audience something that that you know that 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 they can feel. And you know, it's it's a funny sort of thing, Rob. But I think it's it's almost like a um, a lifeblood for him, like both both the giving and then the receiving of the response from the audiences for him. Let me ask you about his performing in early in his career in Toronto, and specifically on Young Street. First of all, probably explain to us the, the importance and the significance of Young Street in Toronto. Well, in, in the 1950s and, and certainly through the 60s as well, Toronto had a, um, a music scene that was largely uh, focused on Young Street, which is the main through fair, the north-south street that uh, um, where all of the the nightclubs were all of the uh, you know this is where all the live music was, but this was all in licensed venues. There was in the 60s what sprang up in in Toronto. Robert was a um, a coffee house district similar to Greenwich Village in New York, where it was all unlicensed coffee houses, and that's really where the folk boom that Lightfoot then became a part of um, was. He was he was very much a, a, a force in 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 Yorkville and at and at coffee houses like the Riverboat. But before that, and this is something that not many people know because they so associate him with the folk period and Yorkville in Toronto, he actually got to start playing in those bars on Young Street and, you know, fighting for people's attention, you know, over the clink of beer glasses and maybe a hockey game on the tel- television above the bar. And, you know, it really, he told me that it really forced him to, to work at, um, you know, grabbing people's attention with his songs. And it was there in, in one of those Young Street bars that uh, Albert Grossman and his partner, John Court, came up from New York to hear this guy that Ian and Sylvia were uh, were raving about. Uh, Ronnie, Haw- Ronnie Hawkins was involved somehow w- with him on Young Street, right? Didn't he Ronnie Hawkins. With Ronnie? Yeah, I mean, you know, your listeners might know Ronnie Hawkins. He was that Ar- the Arkansas rockabilly star who, 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 um, who left Arkansas to... To, to make his name for himself in the bars on Young Street. And he became a huge star in Canada and, of course, famously gave rise to, um, his group was called, called the Hawks, but they, when they flew the coop, they became the band with Robbie Roberts and Rick Danko, Richard Manuel, Levon Helm, and uh, Garth Hudson. And, uh, yeah, Ronnie Hawkins was, you know, he was almost like the unofficial mayor of, of Young Street because he kind of <laughs> ruled one of the biggest clubs there um, in the Neon District um, called the Cock Door. And, and Ronnie caught wind of this young kid playing, playing folk songs and country songs at a, at a little club on Young Street, and he went to see him, and that was Gordon Lightfoot. Ronnie Hawkins thought, you know, he, he, he was a real talent and loved his guitar playing, loved, loved his songs, and, you know, they became basically drinking buddies. Him, Ronnie Hawkins, Gordon Lightfoot, and Ian Tyson all sort of hung out a lot in the bars on Young Street. He he was drinking a lot with a lot of buddies, I hear, though, for, for, for a period of time. Well, you know, I think that, that, you know, Gordon Lightfoot today is very proud of the fact that he, he beat the bottle. He quit drinking in 1982, but it, it was a habit um, that, uh, you know, I guess it's an occupational hazard. It has been for a lot of, a lot of performers. Um, you know, you're in bars, you're, you know, you're, you're you're you're, uh, you're 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 up late at night and you're coming down from the high of performing and you know drinking is just for Gordon Lightfoot it was it began in those those Young Street bars with Ronnie Hawkins and Ian Tyson and then continued through the the 60s into the 70s and uh, by his own admission it really uh, got the better of him and it, it ruined his uh, some of his relationships his mar- his marriages broke up and uh, you know he, he, in his mind 
the song, the, the, the alcohol, the booze was, was, was both a songwriting fuel, but it was also a, I think, a way to, to um, relax him a little bit because as he was becoming this massive star, you know, there was, there was constant uh, attention and, and pressure on him. There were, you know, there were a lot of me- there was a lot of media around him, and he, he's never been comfortable in the spotlight. That, that's one of the, 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 I think, the compelling things, curious things about Gordon Lightfoot is that as big a star as he was, especially in the, in the 1970s, when, you know, he was, he was probably one of the top two or three singer-songwriters in the world. I mean, with, with a number one song and album in Sundown um, simultaneously at the top, you know, on the Billboard charts, I mean, that, I mean, uh, p- people forget just what a difference and what an impact that makes, um, or that that made in those days to have a number one song and album at the same time. And Gordon Lightfoot really was at the top of that heap, but he did not like the uh, uh, the celebrity. I mean, because deep down, Robert Gordon Lightfoot is is a uh, is a small town humble kind of shy guy, and you know he's always tried to let the songs do the talking. But uh, you know when when he got famous, you know I, I think he he had a hard time with it, and the drinking was one of his ways of, of dealing with that. 